Welcome to Exploration Radio, Francois and Rob. Well, pleasure to be here, I guess. Well, yeah, we'll find out towards the end uh, whether it's a pleasure or whether you're going to hate this uh, interview, uh, but we'll, we'll see how we go. It's early 2002. Barico decides to merge with another company, Homestake Mining, to create one of the largest gold companies in the world. A young French-Canadian geologist, don't hold that against him, working for Barrick in Nevada, is asked to pack his bags and move to Australia to take up a vacant chief geologist position for this combined company. At the same time, a young Australian geologist from Adelaide, South Australia, again, don't hold that against him, was working for Homestake and is asked to take over the Australian exploration manager role for the new company. Both men were taking on new management roles, a huge step up for both of them. That's how they first meet. And after uh, you know, five years or so, working in Nevada and helping with corporate evaluations. Following the merger between Barrick and Homestake, uh, I was asked to go to Australia to fill a vacant position they had then, which was a chief geologist. And this was a new role for me. And this is also when I met Rob. He will tell you about this, but he was put in a new role as well. So the two together uh, overlapped in Australia for two and a half years. That was Francois Robert. The other half of the story is about Rob Kritschmaroff. Francois and I clipped straight away and um, you know we've been um, you know I consider Francois has been my mentor you know ever since I've met him and we're still friends to this very day. For the next 20 years the two of them will jointly run the global exploration group for Barrick. Francois as a chief geologist in a technical role and Rob largely as an executive looking after the exploration team and dealing with a lot more of the business and commercial side. So what type of roles do you actually do when you're with a company for 20 years? Well, as you heard, Francois becomes Chief Geologist Australia after having worked for the company for five years, then goes on to do various Chief Geologist roles in the company over the next decade. First in South America, then he works with the Global Exploration Team. Finally, he becomes a Vice President as the main technical guru for another decade before retiring in 2020. And Rob? Well, he starts off running exploration for Africa, Asia and Australia, then becomes Senior Vice President for Exploration globally, but also moonlights in between as co-COO as acting president of South American operations, and finally, he becomes executive vice president for global exploration until he leaves the company in 2021. Both of them worked in the company for more than two decades. Most of that time, they were working together. They were like a two-headed manager, equally adept at the technical side and the commercial management side. I don't know about you, but not only do I find it impressive that they managed to stay in these upper management positions for so long in a major mining company, which is no simple feat by itself, they managed to do it while maintaining a professional relationship for 20 years. I mean, did you get that? 20 years. There are plenty of marriages that don't even last that long. Do you want to know how in sync these two were? They even share a name. Do you know what was happening in 2002 when Rob and Francois first started working together? The iPhone hadn't even been invented. We were still six years away from the iPhone. I mean, did time even exist before we had iPhones? This episode is about two people with different skill sets who decided to work together by creating a relationship of mutual respect and trust. Welcome to Exploration Radio. I guess so you guys formed this partnership when you guys were in Homestake because you were both kind of in new roles. You know, at that time, if you kind of look back, it was there a reason why you kind of complemented each other at that time? I mean, you know, the obvious thing kind of seems to be that, you know, you're both kind of in new roles, so you could kind of leverage off each other as peers. Would that be like an appropriate thing to say? I'll start off and perhaps Francois could chip in. Um, so our skills were complementary. Francois was very much on the technical side. And, you know, his knowledge of deposits um, is, was just absolutely breathtaking. Mine was more on the business of exploration. And so, you know, they were kind of uh, complementary. I would say that we share the same values. Uh, we always strive to do our best. Very much ambitious for helping to make or facilitate some sort of discovery and achieving team success and not personal success. And uh, I had absolute uh, trust in Francois, really neither of us were political beasts. Anything you want to add, Francois? No, I think that that, that captures it. The, the trust is a key component. And the, the other thing is, is for me, when I, when I showed up to Australia, uh, the, the exploration there was very much focused on uh, ex- geochemical approach to exploration. Uh, Robert, remember, in the time I, and I'm a, a, I like field geology and, and rocks. I personally think, as an aside, that we, there's a lot more to read on our crops and drill core that we take the time to do these days. But I love that part, and I guess that that was my one of my contributions in a way. Also, to, there was a space there to to uh, populate in terms of bringing a bit more geology focus in the exploration programs. And, and Ron, Rob provides the, the 
at that time, clearly the, the commercial aspect, as he says, the vision, understanding how exploration works, because I was in learning mode still uh, at that time of how, what are the, the drivers of exploration and how it should align to company. So Rob mentioned to me as his mentor, but he was my mentor on the sort of commercial business side as well. So a lot of what I've learned is through him. It's complementary on that side as well. You mean more understanding what exploration as a business has to do in a company? Yeah, as a, as a business overall and exploration strategy. I was exposed to that in Nevada, but more so in Australia. And so, Rob, you mentioned that, you know, like during your kind of career progression, you got into that commercial side as a business side of exploration. Can you comment a little bit about why should people know a little bit more about running exploration as a business? Can you just comment on how that technical and commercial side has to kind of link together? You know, geologists are generally very curious in nature, and so it's important that you never disconnect on what the ultimate objective is, and that's make a discovery and add some value uh, to the company and hopefully to society in general. What you don't want is for people just to pursue, I guess, intellectual pursuits and do scientific experiments. It needs to be applied and there needs to be results, and uh, you need to learn some aspects of business. And so initially that starts out by being on joint venture committees and then eventually transitions to leading negotiations. And then uh, one one of my roles was to look for new business opportunities, and that means understanding what motivates other companies that have assets or projects that you that you cover you need to understand what their financial drivers and motivations are what their financial capabilities are and then try and find some common ground on on where you could uh, potentially help each other on my side my role being technical as a chief geologist is you want to make sure that quality work is done and all this stuff but it's also the targets you're chasing or discoveries you hope to make will have what the company needs in terms of size or grade. I guess I'm going to call you guys out a little bit here in the fact that you kind of mentioned the way you're kind of talking, you have this commercial side and you have this technical side. If I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that you have to have people that understand both sides, that they can't necessarily be siloed. Is that right? Oh, yeah. For, for me, um, I think. So I'll, I'll put this to Rob. Rob understands the, 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 the business and the deal side of things. Um, I, I yeah, I'm exposed to that, but I don't understand that. I'm not in a position to drive that. But Rob is also an excellent geologist, right? So his focus is more on the strategy, commercial, running the exploration. But you won't fool him on an outcrop or on the target. He's also a very strong geologist. So, so his focus might be more on the exploration management side, but he's very strong technically. That's what I was kind of trying to get to is that, you know, like, although you guys are saying that, you know, like um, Rob's the more astute manager and you're the more astute technical person. Yeah, it can't just be that the bucket is only filled with those two things, that there has to be some component of the other skill set or other skill sets as well. They can't just be purely siloed in that sense. Yeah, and then just before I turn it to Rob, I would say the work we've done together has never been siloed. So it's always very well aligned and we spend a lot of time in the field together reviewing projects, for example, right? with slightly different focus. Uh, but there, there is a there has to be a connection. And then you have to know on both sides enough to be able to communicate and develop trust as well. Rob, do you want to throw your two cents in? Yeah, sure. Um, so Francois is also a very practical geologist as well. And uh, usually when I get to see this is when we participate on uh, due diligence ahead of any sort of uh, acquisition or, or major joint venture. You know, Francois has this unique ability to spend one or two days on site or whatever time is, uh, is uh, allowed by our host. And he'll completely understand uh, the geology. And so when we do a due diligence, Francois really gets down to what are the key things that uh, we don't know? What are the risks and what are the opportunities? And uh, he'll break it down very easily. He's, he's just a very practical person and understands what the company needs. So the obvious question I have is, you know, in a large organization where you have these kind of different departments and different cogs, how do you prevent it from getting siloed? The teams are integrated, so they're, they're two streams, but they're not. This is all the expression team. It's all one team. I would suggest that we had a, a very close team for many years. We had comparatively little voluntary turnover. There was usually some pre-work that had to be done. There were always field visits where we, we would go in teams, and we'd often get um, you know 70 to 80 percent of all of our geologists uh, globally attending that. And so that fostered a real sense of some sort of a barrier exploration community and really being a part of something much larger. Uh, so that was a very powerful thing. I think we also uh, took a lot of time to make sure that uh, our teams had uh, 
plenty of professional development uh, uh, opportunities, but also making sure that we went a silo in the company. I mean, it was always front of mind. Exploration funding comes and goes uh, in the industry. Fortunately, that was never it was never really the case in Barrick. We always enjoyed uh, adequate funding and sometimes very good funding. But I always made a point of making sure that I would simply communicate the value add of the Barrett Exploration Group, what they were getting for the money that was invested in exploration. And, you know, we'd certainly enjoy a fair share of discoveries, uh, some economic uh, bodies that are being mined today and and some that will be mined, but also some not, but always adding value and making sure that uh, every board meeting I attended to, I always focused on the value proposition of exploration and uh, making sure that we communicated with all options uh, so that we weren't out as a silo. So, Fetzwa, did you have any um, people against the idea of trying to bring in such a uh, such an approach? That is a quite an evolved process. So, you know, like so, maybe it takes you more time to kind of go through uh, opportunities, or it takes you a certain amount of time to set up the system and then go through these opportunities. So, did you have any? Um, you know, arguments against adopting a system like this? Well, initially, I remember Alex saying, well, you are on the bus or you're not. So this was no choice. <laughs> you know, it's a, so, so, so I, I, at the outset, at least from my memory, uh, but then people see the, the, the merits. It, 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 it is a bit onerous in terms of, because the budget requests and the budget allocated are tied to these substantiation of what are the, what's the evidence for your target, for example. People recognize that it it's delivers, it's a rig, more rigorous process. It's very transparent as to what are the, the, the most robust targets or pr- proposals. Uh, so people accept that. And, and uh, but, but there's been sometimes people frustrated. They felt that it's a bit limiting. There's always been room for that. And then some colleagues or, you know, expression managers, for example, were, were always were thinking differently and they were not totally satisfied because they had other ideas. But the point I made, here, here's a, a level base, but this is a starting point. If you want to be a hell of a lot smarter and have other ideas to bring in, well, do so, please. Well, Rob, I, I guess I'll lead, I'll throw a lead in a question to you here. In a lot of the ways that Francois is talking about setting this up kind of built around transparency and getting buy-in from people. So, you know, was it important from a management point of view to democratize that kind of transparency or that understanding or that buy-in from from people within the organization? And did you see that as your role, really? The power in the system was um, that everyone had a say. And so the proposer of a project or an idea, they got to present their own idea in front of... um, the entire group and so everyone had a platform everyone had a voice the discussion included everyone so in that way and um, there was no management filter Um, and so people got exposure to a lot of different projects not just their own they got to uh, understand how the senior members of the group were thinking and discussing things Um, so so I think it was very very um, very powerful actually the other part is um, while the Area selection criteria underpins um, the technical aspects, particularly of uh, early stage project at the generative uh, level and, and particularly pre-drilling. Um, as you go up the um, resource triangle into uh, drilling stages, you need to start considering that uh, project economics become increasingly important. So there's that dynamic between um, you know, the importance of having a fact-based assessment, as Francois spoke about, and the increasing importance of understanding uh, the potential value of the ore body. That becomes a um, uh, very much a, a major talking point when you get into more advanced stages of, of a project. So, Rob, I, I want to uh, ask a question about the first point you made. I speak from my experience a little bit here. How do you incentivize people to put ideas or projects in front of upper management? Because I'm assuming, you know, like, and I know this uh, existed in your organization where, you know, you and Francois were quite intimately involved in these kind of technical catch-ups. So how do you get a, you know, a junior geologist or a, you know, a mid-level geologist to actually talk openly in front of you about their project without the fear of, you know, the upper management hammer hitting him at some point? I think part of the answer is that we would spend plenty of time in the field and people become comfortable. You know, you're sharing long car rides or long hikes or whatever, and you have that uh, geological and other banter. So, you know, it puts people at ease and and realise that, uh, you know, we're not some uh, mysterious from the head office. 
that we're geologists just like they are. And so, you know, I think also we took the opportunity to um, to show people that we were genuinely interested in their professional development. And so there was no real judging. Uh, you know, the objective of the whole group was to present an idea. And if the group decided that it wasn't worth pursuing, it's it's really no, no, no problem. Um, and I'd say the other part is that uh, almost every geologist had to put up some sort of proposal or had to speak to something. And so it just becomes embedded in your DNA. It becomes part of the uh, part of the routine. And people generally become more and more comfortable with it once they've done it a couple of times. And so conversely, you know, the obvious question there is how do you handle dissent or how do you handle uh, turning down of opportunities for different geologists? We wouldn't always seek unanimous consensus. In fact, that almost never happened. But when the, a decision was made, people could understand the the, uh, the rationale and the reasons that, that went behind it. And so when we ra- rated and ranked all of our projects at a particular stage of the pipeline, uh, no one had 100% agreement that the best project was the best project and the worst project was the worst project. But generally, people were kind of comfortable that the relative order was was generally okay. Sometimes we would spend, uh, you know, maybe an hour or two discussing a project to make sure that it's, uh, particularly when it was near the cutoff line on whether we would fund it or not, to make sure that everyone had their say. And then ultimately, if it was still ambiguous, obviously myself or Francois would have to make that call, but people had their say. To me, that's quite interesting that you're kind of talking about, you know, like obviously they, in this group, there was a significant component around the technical side and, you know, applying technical rigor and, and getting better technically. From what you're describing, you know, that's more of the softer skills uh, that had to be kind of applied in the group. And do you think that they were both quite important to kind of manage from both aspects? Yeah, so the Barrow Exploration System originally had three pillars, and we used to call it people, pipeline, knowledge. One was about how we share knowledge across the group, so I won't go into that. We've kind of touched on the uh, technical part, but then there was the people pillar, and that was really on how we um, how we develop uh, our teams, how we give them professional development opportunities, how we give them challenging assignments, how we assess performance. And a key part of the performance assessment is it can't be just a tick sheet. Francois and I would go to each region and we would uh, spend typically two or three days talking about every single junior scientist and other key members of the exploration team, you know, looking at where there were development opportunities where people needed a bit of a boost and where we recognise outstanding talent, uh, making sure that uh, they didn't get bored in those jobs and we gave them some sort of international challenging transfer or, or a promotion or whatever the case may be, just to make sure that people uh, progressed uh, through their careers and were satisfied with, it, with the challenging work. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on that, and that wasn't something that was driven by HR. That was entirely driven by, uh, uh, by our exploration team. And so do you think that, that yeah, this kind of investment that you made in people uh, elicited some level of loyalty back to the group and to the company in some sense? I think it did. So, you know, for example, there was a time that we had uh, some of our South American geologists. We had some in Alaska. We had some in British Columbia. We had uh, some, uh, quite a few in Papua New Guinea. Uh, we had uh, members of a member of our Tanzanian exploration team come over to Nevada for a year uh, to expedite his entry into a management role. And so, you know, put together with not only time, also in making sure that. Uh, as quick as possible and that uh, that's one reason why you know during last booms we had a big very little voluntary uh, turnover so Rob, I guess I'll ask a maybe a slightly sensitive question uh yeah in a world where companies are you know more and more concerned about bottom line uh, how do you as a manager justify uh you know things like this because there is an added cost in kind of doing this you know uh, not just in your time, you know, your and Francois' time and going around places, but also a financial cost. Uh, so how do you, uh, you know, like how do you communicate that to kind of upper management? I think the, uh, you know, they're exactly uh, sophisticated enough to understand that exploration is essentially a knowledge uh, industry. And they understand that uh, it's important to invest in, in, the, in the talent pool. So I don't think that part of it's really become an issue. Um, when we go into busts and, you know, at times Barrett had definitely made the missteps and we were in financial dire straits there for quite, quite a few years, um, that, that's a time where the whole business is suffering and, you know, you need to uh, understand that uh, some very difficult decisions have to be made. 
And so, you know, unfortunately, I have had to downsize our group on, on occasion, uh, but it's always with transparency. It's always making sure that people understand the business reasons and it's not for performance. Uh, it's, it's really just the business is, is hurting and we have to do what we have to do to survive. I guess, uh, you know, that was kind of my question here in that, you know, the, the, the picture that you're painting, I think, is, you know, like obviously in a, in a boom, a lot of those things can be rationalized quite easily. Uh, but yeah, in a bust, yeah, it becomes harder and harder to kind of rationalize how you still get that loyalty from people, especially, you know, when you're having to downsize and you're having to let teams go, um, you know, people working in, uh, certain teams are watching, you know, half of their colleagues walk out of the door. Uh, so I guess, you know, like I'm interested in, uh, that aspect because, you know, you guys mentioned WMC before, and I think, you know, one of the things that WMC and a few companies, you know, of that era did really well is that they uh, had this kind of uh, investment in people development, not just during the boom cycles, but during the bus cycles as well, where they tried to retain as many people as possible, you know, even if it was on half salaries or allowing people to go study and paying for their study and things like that. And I guess that's, that's an aspect that, you know, we might have uh, somewhat lost in our industry through this kind of uh, bottom line rationalization that we seem to do in, in bus cycles. Uh, so, I'm, so, you know, so I guess my question was kind of a lead in into that about how I understand during the boom cycles when money is plenty and business is pretty healthy, but, you know, like how committed are you or how committed do you have to be to that, uh, this aspect of personal development during the bus cycles when, when arguably you end up losing a lot of your company knowledge during that time? Yeah, so I would say that um, we generally continued to invest through bus cycles. What really hurt us is um, we had a, um, a mess at Pasqualama. Uh, that was a, it was never um, completed, and we invested um, you know, north of $7 billion of capital in that. And then we also did the Equinox uh, acquisition uh, on a, on a low-grade uh, copper deposit in Zambia, really close to, very close to the peak of the copper price. And we were we had thirteen billion dollars in debt, and so that was almost an existential crisis. And so that was a time where we had to make some very very tough decisions uh, for the business to survive. But generally, during previous busts, um, you know, we continued to develop our people. The, on the retention issue, uh, so Rob is right. So we did have one of those world class technical conferences uh, at the downtime because people the, at management recognized the, the value for exploration. And uh, so that, that carries a lot of weight with people. And the other factor, um, I would say, is Rob and I, um, perhaps not so much when the company got really big, but we knew personally each of our geologists or geoscientists, their family situation. So there was always a because, – because Rob's like that, is people person. I'm a people person as well. So that, that there was a connection uh, just beyond the professional relationship. Right, so so you, you get to know people. You ask about their families. That carries a lot of weight, and that that's also that that um, personal side to uh, our interaction with people also help um, when in terms of loyalty or retention of people in tough times. The other one is um, Beric, especially under Rob, has been pretty good supporter of participating in research programs, trying to advance uh, technology and use and apply. You know. Uh, not not stupidly, but but smartly apply emerging technologies and things like that, and that 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 puts Beric at the forefront. And the 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 really strong, well talented geologists and technically inclined geologists see this, uh, and they see Beric as a leading company, and that's also another factor. These points that you made, uh, Francois, you know, like in my kind of research for this interview, you know, one of the things that kind of came across is that it, this, uh, I guess, empathetic approach or, you know, higher EQ approach that you guys applied and, you know, trying to get to know people and, you know, like actually caring about their personal development or, you know, just kind of caring about them in general. Uh, I think, you know, it really came kind of across that, you know, that's something you guys put a lot of time and effort in. Um, and I guess, you know, that's kind of what I was trying to get to is that I think sometimes maybe managers in, in certain organizations think that it's purely a, a rational optimization problem. But, you know, but there's also the component in the fact that, you know, there are people involved in this whole process. So you, so you have to have this more EQ approach as well, particularly in big organizations, because, you know, there, there's a way that you can incentivize people that maybe not necessarily is purely driven by uh, financial means. 
Yeah, no, I, I think you make a very good point um, in that we, we got to know people on a personal level, and I think you touched on it, uh, you know, the uh, EQ. Uh, it's a nice idea that you can't know it's either innate or, or not, and I have to the front where it is. Um, it, the other thing I would say that, uh, you know, I was very humble. He shares what he knows. There was always time for a bit of a laugh. And uh, while it was uh, intellectually enriching for me and, you know, lots of funds too, our, our both of our families, Francois's family and my family, they also click, which really, really makes it uh, easy. All of the stuff that you're saying kind of sounds very obvious, right? But how do you maintain that when, you know, like in, you're in a big organization, uh, how do you uh, ensure that the culture kind of goes through the whole organization? Because that's, I guess, always a challenge. And you know? when you have small teams, uh, you know, you have line of sight to everyone and it's, and it's kind of easier to know uh, everyone. But, you know, like how do you do it in a big organization when you have big teams, you know, they're spread over large uh, or different geographies, uh, you know, there's different skill sets, language, culture. How, like, how do you manage that? It's really about being consistent and basically reading the news and not deviating from that. So, you know, people understand what you uh, what you stand for, what the company stands for, what the team's objectives are. And so, you know, ha- having these, um, you know, global budget discussions where everybody uh, gets to participate and hear the same message and the same conversations and arguments uh, at the same time, that's one opportunity. Um, Francois used to do a... Um, uh, essentially a monthly technical newsletter that went out to all of our staff and so messages were, were reinforced that way. I would occasionally do uh, town halls, uh, you know, with all expiration hands on deck and uh, invite questions, uh, making sure that it was just complete transparency and consistency. And so you just got to take every opportunity to, to, to c- communicate whatever the message is. So in that vein, Rob, how do you deal with criticism? Because if you're putting yourself out there in such an open manner and a transparent manner, how do you deal with criticism uh, coming back towards you? I think you have to accept it and you have to discuss it. Um, you're not always going to agree. Sometimes you have to agree to disagree, but it's important to have a uh, you know an honest, transparent um, uh, conversation. You mentioned that you know like you have to take kind of the the political gains out of this kind of interaction as well. You know, you mentioned that you were not a political animal. You never wanted to be one. Uh, do, you, do you think that's part of the process as well, that people know that, you know, like you're doing this for, uh, you know, you're kind of submitting to the uh, the needs of the team or the organization rather than your own personal gain in a lot of ways? Yeah, I mean, I never aspired to being the head of exploration for Barrick. Um, I kind of fell into it, partly luck and partly hard work for sure. And I would say it was the same with uh, same with Francois. We're more ambitious for discoveries, um, and we have this term uh, in Barrett exploration, and it's about being discovery driven. You know, making sure that everyone's completely online on actually adding value. That's, that's that's really what gives your job a sense of purpose. You know, when you make a discovery, and then hopefully it gets mined, and then that makes a contribution to communities and society in in general. And so our ambition for our teams to develop that's incredibly rewarding. And I have to say that. You know, I've worked with many, there's many uh, Barrick alumni out there, and I'm just so pleased that uh, many of them are doing very well. Every time I hear of their success, um, you know, it just brings me great joy. And so, um, again, focusing on developing people, on uh, achieving team success, and then making discovery, that's, that's the important thing. And so one last question in this vein, from an outsider point of view, uh, Beric, particularly at the board level, looks to be a very, uh, uh, very politically driven. Yeah, you know, there, there seems to be quite a lot of political uh, machinations uh, at the board level. So how do you as a person that is willingly not trying to play those games or not trying to be involved in that, uh, that kind of um, you know, like a, a political toing and froing, how do you survive in an organization like Beric? So in Barrick, uh, for over 10 years, I used to go to every board meeting and I would make a board presentation and I would always remind them of the value proposition and being able to break down what we do into something that uh, board members of very diverse uh, backgrounds and quite often with no technical knowledge um, that they could understand what we were doing and how we were adding value. And so by you know constantly showing that you're aligned with the business objectives that what you and your teams are doing are going to add value to the company. And by having regular success, as we had enjoyed, um, you know, it sort of maintains that credibility. 
did you ever doubt your approach at any point? No, not really. I, um, you know, I've always strove to do my best. If my honesty doesn't appeal to people and ultimately I'll get fired, well, so, so be it. That's fine. I had no doubt that I would get another job. But I have to say, you know, working for Barrack was uh, very rewarding for me. You know, it was a Barrack, Barrack was a very was very ambitious. The company was always evolving, and so for me, it was like a new company every few years. And certainly, we had our uh, we had quite a few CEOs uh, during that time. But I must say, it was a very very exciting place. You know, as I said, we had some missteps, and that certainly made things uh, interesting and, and challenging. But really, when you have a look at the uh, international span of the company and the resources that we were given to fund our exploration programs. Uh, meant that we had every opportunity to make some sort of discovery and make a difference to uh, to the company or or to society in general. And as I said, that gives real meaning and purpose to what you do. And so I've always been proud of what Barrick stood for and achieved. But that, you know, Barrick's values are great. Sure, we make missteps, but it's not something that um, that we obviously deliberately do. And so you know, we've enjoyed our team's fair share of discoveries. Um, as I said, some economic and not economic uh, deposits. But uh, always adding value and always having that sense of uh, fulfillment. Uh, I've been very, very grateful to the company. And so, Rob, uh, in your role, you know, like I guess you have this, you know, you almost have kind of two masters in some ways. You know, you have the board, which is where you have to kind of manage up and, and kind of sanitize the, the message or the value proposition of exploration to the board. And then the, the second part of it is how do you take the, the feedback from the board and kind of pass it down to, to your team, which is kind of managing downwards as well. Uh, so how do you, I mean, is, first of all, is that a fair way to kind of say where your role kind of sits or the, the description of your role? And then how do you manage that, that, that conflict as well? How much do you think of your role being managing up and how much of it being kind of sending the message down? Uh, so I just want to clarify something. So in the last couple of years, I haven't been uh, directly reporting to the board. When a new board member starts, I would take them through an hour or two of, uh, of induction, I guess, explaining the business of exploration. And that's on a one-on-one, -on -one, much more personal level. But uh, previously, when I was attending all of the board meetings, it's really a two-way street, um, you know, conveying the value proposition of, of, of uh, Barrett Exploration upwards, but then also um, whether it was from the CEO or the board, I would uh, circle back with uh, with our teams and explain these are the issues in the company. Um, you know, sometimes it wasn't pleasant. Sometimes it was, look, you know, we've got $13 billion in debt. Um, we're going to have to deal with it and we're going to have to make some very tough decisions. And so just, just want everyone to understand and uh, give you a up be prepared for it in the coming weeks or months or whatever, we'll get into some more detail. So really, again, it's about uh, making sure that the messages flow both in both directions. And it's about uh, the, the team you're talking about, Rob. It's, it's, as a you know, watcher of this, I was, Rob's always been very transparent, or as transparent as he could be as to those issues and, and passing on the guidelines or message from the board. And that transparency... Uh, people recognize it's been consistent and then that that helps uh, at the receiving end of the message from from the top so francois at, at any point uh in your time at Barrick, did you ever uh want to take on rob's role did you ever want to get into kind of the management side of things no i'm, I'm, I'm a technical guy and i honestly believe i wouldn't have the, uh, some of the required characteristics or or skills to, to operate and successfully in that, in that role. So that, 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 I'm, I'm happy focusing on the technical side. I never really had aspiration. I'm going to jump in here, Francois. I completely disagree. I think you could have easily done my role and done it well. Well, I guess the reason why I'm asking this question is, uh, you know, like one of the feedback that I kind of got in my research is that I think both of you kind of undersell your skill set outside of the space or the job that you were doing. I think, Rob, yeah, like you, um, the feedback was that you are a much better technical geologist than you sell yourself as. And Francois, I think you were, you're a much better manager than you sell yourself as. So I, I think, you know, like the reason I guess why I kind of asked that question is that, you know, to me, it seemed like you guys were very, um, you know, your skill sets were very complementary as well as kind of interchangeable to some degree that, you know, maybe the reason why you, you know, like if I'm taking Francois's position, maybe the reason why you understood the stuff that Rob was going through is because I think you had that skill set or you had that awareness as well and vice versa from Rob's point of view. Certainly the awareness and the, the you know, Rob and I interacted very regularly over time and 
uh, just just the relationship we have outside work is fun. This is Rob said, we're, we're good friends, and this is forever. The one thing I miss, uh, having left uh, Barrick now, is is that the interaction and going out in the field or on these these different uh, meetings with with Rob and other colleagues uh, at Barrick, where there was a, a intense but you know geologically rewarding but also a fun part of it, you know, and, and that, the, the social aspect of uh, the interaction. That again stems from the, the understanding each other, the trust, and both focused on on helping the company, not uh, advancing our own careers. Just like Rob, I, I never aspired to be chief geologist in the first place, uh, but opportunities were offered, and I, I was prepared to make the jump. Sometimes I felt I was not prepared, um, and a few times in my tenure at Beric, I, I felt, geez. Uh, this is, I do my best all the time, then I felt that maybe my best is not good enough. Um, but there's people around you to support you and help you to discuss these things. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, you know, like that you're kind of like quite honest and open about the fact that you you struggled in these roles. Because, uh, yeah, maybe I, like from my point of view, I don't think that's a perspective many people kind of uh, put out. You know, it seems to be that it's it's a sign of weakness and, you know, you can't do that in a in a senior position because, yeah, you're just gonna get um, eaten alive by other people in an organization. But I think it, you know, like the the, the level of self doubt that you have in a role, I think, is quite a healthy thing to have. Oh, I, I totally agree. And then, you know, it, it, it's a bit cliche, but uh, your profession as a geoscientist, or irrespective if you're in a technical role or management role, it, it's a lifelong learning, right? And uh, if you're willing to learn. I'm still learning heaps of stuff in the part-time work I'm doing, geological work. I'm doing. Uh, if you're prepared to accept that you have a lot to learn, then you're prepared to accept that you have weaknesses, right? And let's, let's fix them or let's fill the gaps if you can. And those weaknesses may be on the uh, skill set side of things or on the soft side as well. But you just have to be uh, humble and work on improving. No, yeah, well said. Um, so one one thing that kind of comes across very obvious is that you know you guys uh, had a good uh, professional relationship as well as a personal relationship. Uh, how do you um, how do you keep that separate, or how do you make sure that the the professional side doesn't impinge on the personal side, and and vice versa? I would say that um, you know for sure you um, you make friendships uh, during the course of your work, but again it comes down to what do we stand for as a team and what's the objective. And so sometimes you need to um, you know you need to make some very very difficult decisions uh, uh, you know, about whether to retain someone who, who you know took up the friendship and, and that you genuinely like. But in, it comes down to business. We're working in a business and we've got to be objective. And uh, I think for Francois and myself, we. Um, Again, it just really comes down to that transparency and and the honesty, and uh, and the and the respect, I guess. Um, you know, I would never do anything to undermine Francois, uh, especially on uh, technical. In general, it's just not in my do that. Um, I don't really have a good answer for you. I think it's a it's a uh, there's no clear answer to that, but it, it's a natural thing. So any any the professional side. Good decisions have to be made. Tough decisions have to be made, and 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 the relationship and trust we have. You understand that. And then there were times where I really struggled with uh, when when Rob took the, the the right decision, smart decision to close down Australia Pacific. And what for what was forefront in my mind was more my feeling than the rationale part. But gee, we're going to lose all these these geo friends and technical expertise. But if you put that aside. And think about it. It's, it was the decision to be made, and Rob made that decision. Uh, sorry, Rob, if I come to that, but uh, made that decision before it was imposed. Right? Uh, it would have been imposed. A little bit. So there's a lot of there was a lot of foresight. So if you, if you understand that part, when it's time after work to go and have a beer or a drink, you put you put that aside. Right? That doesn't that that your your uh, personal relationship should not be affected by this. And certainly in my my head, uh, there's the there's the job part and the social part. And, and, um, it can affect your mood, but it cannot affect the relationship you have uh, or the trust you have in the person. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good way to kind of put it. I think that the trust, and I think you kind of touched on it, Rob, as well, is that, you know, I think you just have to trust that, you know, when decisions are being made, they're not being made to um, 
for any personal gain or for any personal attack or anything like that. You know, you're doing it because that's what the business kind of requires. So um, I think, you know, maybe that's that's simply the way that you have to kind of look at it from both both sides of the fence. Yeah, and just one other thing that uh, Francois touched on that I think is really important. It's, it's important that you never shirk your responsibility. And so um, if a tough business business decision needs to be uh, made, you need to get ahead of it. You can't be waiting for your CEO or the board or other members of the uh, to tell you to make this decision. You can only build credibility by uh, managing your own business and taking responsibility for it. That continues to build credibility. Do you mean, uh, you know, is that the comment around when you have to kind of close regions or let go of people uh, in teams? Are, are you commenting on the fact that, you know, that's the responsibility that you shouldn't shirk? So whether it's to whether you're doing critical analysis of the business and you realise that uh, expression is expensive and perhaps uh, could be, and then you know there's really a question that uh, at the time we were the company said we would never do uh, deep marine tailings disposal, no riverine tailings disposal, no erodible waste dumps. You have to question well what are we doing here? Is this a really good investment um, that that we could make? Um, there was also a long stretch where there were no discoveries being made in Australia, not by us, and in fact, not by anybody for many years. And so rather than wait for a uh, decision to be made for me, I took responsibility for that and uh, decided to give everyone an equal haircut, really just close down an entire region and fully fund where some of our best opportunities at the time were. So that's that's in terms of managing the whole business, but also sometimes you know we need to pare back the budget, and so rather than going to the uh, uh, CEO and board with an inflated budget and uh, letting them do the hard work and say that's too much, uh, you need to reduce it. We'd always plan alternative scenarios so that um, you know if funding was tight, we knew exactly what projects we we would try and we would be prepared for that and make our own decisions rather than be told to do continues to have credibility so when you make decisions like this like tough business decisions how important do you think it is that you know like you are the person kind of providing that message and it's not being done through some you know corporate means or something like that do you think it's uh it's imperative that you are also the you know essentially the messenger and the agent of that that uh that message or that that decision it is critical. If you shirk that responsibility, uh, people will see it for what it is. It, it's completely disingenuous. I think you have to own, you know, you have to own your own business and be responsible for the decisions that you made. And sometimes, you know, part of that is delivering uh, honest, frank, straightforward bad news, and uh, you know, allowing, making sure that there's a discussion that can happen. You know, sometimes the the path is set, and uh, you know, uh, a tough decision is going to be made allowing people the opportunity to probe and ask questions around it why you know why are we doing this uh, it's a really important part of learning process excellent answer thanks rob um so we're so we're kind of getting close to the end of our interview and i guess i want to ask just some uh uh just some pointed kind of questions so you know the, both of you have been involved in the exploration game for a long long time uh, what do you think it takes to be a good explorationist? So I, I'll start off with you, Francois. Yeah, so from your point of view, what does it take to be a good explorationist? Now, you can answer from a technical point of view or a more holistic point of view, but uh, you know, what do you think? I think you need a strong skill base, uh, geological skill base in the first place. Uh, that, that's the bread and butter of the profession. So... And, and you need to be able to, uh, when you make observations, say in drill core, just as an example, in drill core or on an outcrop, you need to understand to, to be able to recognize what's in that outcrop or piece of drill core that is significant for understanding the, 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 the strength of a target or potential controls of mineralization. So there has to be a connection between what you can observe, even with your hand lens, and, and the implications at the project scale. Which is which is uh, comes with experience, but but good technical skills and understanding the the uh, also the uh, an appreciation for the rate of success in exploration, right? Uh, it, it's 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 a, it's a failure business in a way, <clears throat> so you need to to understand that. And a good exploration geologist, uh, in my mind, 
has spent early on time in the mine uh, as a mine geo uh, because it it exposes you to what it needs what's needed for a successful operation right on the metallurgical side geotech side um, mining side metallurgy so 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 you're exposed early on to uh, the number of stars that need to be aligned for a really profitable operation and that you carry that with you then in exploration so to me and western mining used to do this and that's how i started because i did my phd in underground and spent for my phd about a year underground in the mine so you get exposed to that and i think it's it's a it's a fundamental platform if i can say so for a geologist when you then go to exploration so you drill fences of holes and you connect the dots between the fences with straight lines but if you've been in a mine you know that the reality will be a little bit different right? so have an appreciation for that that's a great answer i think uh yeah like these kind of different skill sets that you need uh is ultimately what uh, allows you i think to be successful and you have to be open-minded as well you always have to as a geologist be prepared to learn the one thing i do is i go in the field uh, with geologists that know a hell of a lot more than me about their target types or high sulfidation systems, for example. So I commonly ask, uh, and I share this with younger geologists, I, I'm not afraid of asking stupid questions. I still do, but I would ask, okay, you're a specialist in this deposit type. Here's an outcrop with alteration or mineralization. What are the critical things that you look for? And teach me how to recognize that myself, right? And, and, and that that's how you build your skill base. And I still, to this day, do this when I'm in the field. So that, that's a, that, the, the other quality of an ex, need for an expression geologist is to be in constant learning mode, or it can be learning about shortwave infrared stuff. I, I don't know the ins and out of that, but I know well that this particular shift in uh, 2200 nanometer uh, position of that line, that, that absorption trough in white mica tells you a lot about alteration. So that's all I need to know. But you need to ask somebody to explain to you how that works and why it's important. So that's the learning aspect of a good exploration geologist. Ah, that's excellent. Uh, Rob, do you want to uh, throw any uh, any comments further to what Francois said? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's a fair bit of overlap, but really fundamental is you've got to have some sort of strong technical foundation. You might not necessarily need to be a world expert on anything, but a really broad, strong technical foundation of many different deposit styles um, and really having a look at many different rocks. Uh, some operations experience is really critical and, and important and something I didn't really appreciate all that much early in my career. Lots of field work, uh, especially early in someone's career, and I would advise people not to specialise early. I think having uh, a sense of curiosity, uh, creativity, and also that uh, discovery-driven um, uh, element that's that's really important for a successful explorationist, not someone who's just pursuing intellectual uh, uh, curiosities you know, someone who actually wants to make a discovery and make a difference. Understand the whole business, as Francois said, is really important. So uh, understanding commercial aspects of the business, legal, metallurgy, mining, that's all building a more complete picture and understanding how exploration fits in the whole mining ecosystem. And so it's very important to have some career diversity, uh, understanding project economics to make sure that you're not wasting uh, valuable uh, dollars on uh, drilling out a project that's ultimately going to be futile because that's a massive opportunity cost and uh, it's a way at your credibility. Developing strong communication skills is really important um, and being able to simplify a message so that a lay person uh, can understand what the value proposition is. It's also important that every geologist um, learns how to articulate their ideas and influence other people you know, because you could have the world's best idea, but if you can't communicate it and articulate it, you're not going to get any buy-in. You know, nothing's going to happen. Uh, again, you know, understanding and conveying the value proposition of exploration uh, all the, uh, frequently, that's important. And uh, I guess finally, uh, having critical thinking skills. You know, exploration is not really a recipe-driven approach. Sometimes you need to make uh, leaps and, and think a little bit more creatively, ask those questions. What if this uh, variable has changed? What if that variable had changed? What, what would the deposit or the, or the anomaly look like? Oh, that's an excellent answer. Um, just as an aside to that, Rob, I just want to throw something quick at you. Uh, you, you 
you, both of you have kind of mentioned this, uh, like, you know, the non-linearity of the exploration process. Uh, how do you manage that aspect of exploration in an organization when it becomes big and it inevitably becomes more administratively run? You know, how do you make sure that the scales don't tip too far one way or the other? Um, perhaps I'll start. It's important to spend that time in the field and also asking the um, asking the geologists why are you doing this particular survey? Does it actually add any value? Uh, you know, sometimes you can skip step. Uh, and at various times in my career, I've seen um, I've seen geologists uh, you know revert to collecting uh, a series of layers because that's that's how they've been taught, perhaps in their previous company. You know, you've got to do some soil sampling and then you've got to do this and then you've got to do a geophysics survey uh, and so on and so forth you need to you need to really query what's the value of the data that you're collecting and if it has low value don't do it just make that uh, make that leap and, and move move forward quicker rather than uh, just a series of process steps expression can't be a process yeah and I, I will just add to that this is where the area selection criteria at different scales uh, come in as well because it shows you what's important to see what you'd like to see in a prospective target, uh, again, at different scales. But then it tells you, okay, what's missing? I, I personally use that, well, mentally at least, uh, as a checklist when I go and visit projects or out, you know, uh, target stage or target delineation stage. And <clears throat> that, that's a, it tells you uh, what is the gap in understanding your target. And any additional work uh, needs to be tailored to address, uh, answering that, filling that gap. So answering that question, do I have the right kind of alteration? And then you can only, all you need to do then is to use the whatever technique or tool or approach that will answer that question. Do I have this kind of alteration? Can I vector into it or not? So that shortcuts a whole bunch of other steps. So it helps you identify what are the key questions to answer to advance the project to the next stage. So that, that there's a connection there, a simple connection that, that geologists, certainly in the very context, understand. Yeah, excellently put. Um, all right, two last questions for both of you before we, we finish up. Uh, so the first question, and this is a question that we ask all of our guests. So first question, what is something that you think needs to die in mining or exploration? It could be an idea, a concept, a behavior, uh, something that you think we need to jettison out of our industry. More transparency, uh, you know, perhaps sometimes even enforcement uh, is important, uh, and making sure that exploration is a serious endeavor that's uh, genuinely looking to add value rather than having some of these lifestyle companies. Well, you're not going to make many friends with that comment, Rob. I know. <laughs> Maybe edit that one out, actually. <laughs> no, it's, it's funny. It's, it's all right, Rob, because we've had a whole episode on this with, um, I don't know if you know, John Goodman from Dundee. Yeah, basically, we did a whole uh, episode with him because he came on. And yeah, this is one of his bugbears, obviously, as an investor. Uh, so yeah, so it's already been put out there, and he slammed a few people along the way. So I, I don't think uh, yours is going to be that. It's not going to have that that strong and illicit response, hopefully. But I think it's something that a lot of people should say a lot more. I and uh, Francois, then also, so what I was, it's not so much such stop doing, but well, in a way. But uh, so we collect in the mine environment, for example, or advanced project stage. Uh, but it's more especially in a mine or near mine environment, we collect a lot of data. And the data sits there in databases, and it's being modeled, uh, not always in leapfrog 3D, that kind of stuff. And, and, and what uh, I find is that having a model then becomes the endpoint, as opposed to it being the starting point to ask questions and try to use that information, collated information, to understand controls of mineralization, why is it controls of mineralization in general, high grade, and so on. So there's a whole... Uh, stage of analytical or geological analysis or interpretation work that, that needs to uh, augment the collated information. And I find that this piece um, is, is uh, commonly weak uh, in, in, in my exposure to different companies. So we have the, sometimes we don't have the information, but when we have it, it's collated in, in 3D models or whatever level plans or maps, but then that should be the platform for the real serious work, and I don't see enough of that. So, what you what the industry should stop doing, it should stop ending at having collated the data, go beyond to analyze the data in terms of what it means for mineralization. Excellent answer. 
I think it's 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 a great point that you know we seem to think that the job uh, of exploration geologists or even geologists is to just make sure that the the data makes it into the database and the job's done. You know, we seem to forget that that's the there's a whole another part of the world that we should be working on as well. Yeah, it, it's not articulated that way, but that that's that's in essence that's what it is. And the other one is uh, stop looking at your drilling database then sections only. Look at level plan. Geologists are trained to look at level plans. And commonly, um, if you're in an environment with steeply plunging folds, if you only work in section, because that's what the software is designed to do, uh, then you're missing the picture. So you always need to look at level plans as well. But this is not um, a natural uh, thing that's done by the younger geologists, I would say. So stop looking at just sections, look at level plans. Excellent. Um, and so conversely, and last question, what is something that you think we need to maintain in our industry at all costs? Something that you think is fundamental to our DNA that we should never forget? Geology and observations remain the foundation of our prof- of, of exploration. Nice, short and sharp. I think for me, there's two things. Uh, one is uh, understanding the uh, business of the exploration, how, how best to add value um, using the you know, shareholders' uh, money, basically. And the other part is uh, making sure that you understand completely what the community um, concerns and issues are. That's, that's really, really critical, and that's something we need to do better at. Excellent. That's a great point. That's it, guys. That's the end of our interview. I really appreciate you giving up your time. Thanks a lot for joining us. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Thanks for the opportunity, Ahmad. This episode of Exploration Radio has been brought to you by Ahmad Salim and Steve Beresford. Produced by Sean Jeffrey edited by Hamayu Mir, and recorded remotely in late 2021. Exploration Radio is supported by the AIG, the MCA, the Society of Economic Geologists, One to One Group, and the ASSE. And we are an official media partner of the 2022 PDAC conference. So why geology? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in the outdoors, and I'm scientifically, cur- scientifically curious. And uh, that's been in me for a long time. I remember I was uh, uh, middle to late high school and I knew I wanted to go into geology and it was uh, simmering in my my mind that maybe doing graduate studies that early. And the real kicker, if I may, my my kids called me a nerd, but uh, so my dad brought home one day a a kit from Bell Canada Laboratories. They had various kits, scientific kits, and it was a cardboard, uh, fully operational polarizing microscope and it was uh, focused on crystals and light. And um, I'm hesitant to say this, but I've learned, I was grade 10 or 11 in high school, I've learned uh, interference figures on a microscope using that cardboard polarizing microscope and looking at all sorts of things. So that, that was uh, <clears throat> also prompted my interest in, in let's say, earth sciences. Yeah, wow. Uh, so the same question to you, uh, Rob, uh, why geology? I think I kind of uh, fell into it. Um, the, the moment the seed was planted, I was in grade 10, believe it or not, and um, I was walking up the stairs to the library and our careers guidance counsellor, Mr Burns, uh, yelled out to me and my two friends, hey boys, there's jobs in geology. And I said, what's that Mr Burns? He's there, well, I don't know, look it up in your careers uh, guidebook. And so I went home that night and I looked it up and I looked at, uh, you know, the requisites, must enjoy working outdoors, must be creative and all those sorts of things. And so that planted the seed. Uh, as I went through high school, I was um, very much a science channel. And so when I went to university, I picked up uh, geology, chemistry, physics and maths. And in second year, there was only one geology subject and two chemistry subjects. And uh, <laughs> towards the end, um, because there was no second uh, geology uh, subject at Adelaide University in those days. And so I remember the lecturer for chemistry coming in sort of saying, we're not doing a practical for the next couple of weeks. We're going to take you out and show you the exciting life of what a chemist uh, does. And so the first week they took us to Amdell Laboratories and I saw these chemists with white lab coats pressing buttons on machines and writing uh, things down on clipboards. And I thought that looks very much like a factory job. I'm not interested because I've worked in factories. And the second week, they took us to the forensic labs, which was really fascinating. And I remember speaking with the chief scientist there, and I said, how many of these labs are there? He said, just one. I said, well, how many of you guys are there? He said, well, there's about 16 of us. 
And I said, ah, oh, so how often do jobs come up? He said, yeah, well, honestly, almost never. Um, and so that really sealed the deal. I, don't, I was already enjoying geology, so, so that's basically how I found geology.